Alan has posted the link to today's session. The, the course material is on there. Um, otherwise, um, Ashton did send an email yesterday with the correct link. Please use the, the, the one that says, know your data module two data fun, uh, fundamentals. That's the one that we are following for today. So the, in the, in the chat again. Yeah, so the purpose of today is just to give you some little bit of a background in terms of why we need to visualize the data from looking at it in a tabular format. Sometimes it's very difficult. So we're going to look at some of the principles of data visualization, why we need to do with data visualization and the importance of storytelling in a way, because if we're looking at the numbers, we also need to understand what does what does those numbers tell us or what this story is telling us and also the purpose of why we need to look at the number and make sense of it in terms of whether do we want to inform people or do we want them to take action or they just want to look at the information and acknowledge that it exists. And that is generally the purpose of today and later on we're going to take you through the Sia Pumelala KPIs, which are our key performance indicators that we report on, that were agreed upon uh, with the uh, funder in terms of the report that we submit at the end of each year. Uh, Charles will take you through that while I take you through the first part of the introduction to data visualization. Um, Charles, do you have anything to say before we begin with today's session? No, that's fine. <clears throat> I've also asked Ashton just to send out a completed uh, um, template of all the student success indicators to everyone just to look at. It's, it's very interesting. It's one that was originally developed by ATD and we adjusted it a bit, uh, but I'll talk about it when I get to it, but it has been emailed to you as well, everyone. Thank you. Yes. Okay. And later today, uh, uh, not actually later, just now, uh, when we go into the breakout sessions, we would like you also to upload. No, you, you don't have to upload anything for today. We, we would like you to talk through your table that you, we gave you last week that you submitted uh, and discuss. We will also give you some guiding question in terms of helping you, those that do not have data visualization already developed for their module pass rate, then they will get some guidance today and they can go and develop those. And we will expect you next week to come and do a full on presentation on any of the KPIs that we're going to be sharing with you today. For today's session, uh, like I said, we are going to be talking about data visualization. It's about making sense of that data. And if we have it in a table, how do we visualize it so that we are able to identify the patterns and trends? Because visualizing your data can help identify the hidden meaning within your data or the hidden pattern or trends within your data. Can you go to my presentation? That's when I'm going to start start with the presentation. So our discussion for this next 10 minutes will be around why, what is visualization. And this quote says it all, by visualizing information, we're turning it into a landscape that can explore with your eyes, a sort of an information map. And you will see that the, the majority of the discussion for today, we will, talk, we, will talk, we will be talking about how do we visualize the information because it makes it easier for the eyes to see and navigate the data. Next slide. So my session will cover why is data visualization important, the principles of communication, as well as why do we need to give meaning to the data that we are using? Next. We visualize the data because we want to understand or look at the patterns or trends or understand the information that is given in the table. We normally work with Excel sheets. Uh, when we do surveys, we collect this massive information, we download it, it's in Excel, and we cannot make sense of 
this massive information, sometimes we summarize it into tables. Usually when you put it into tables, it's not also uh, easy to understand, easy to see where the challenges might be until you can visualize it and be able to see at the glance immediately the story that is coming up from your data. So last week we spoke about the different types of data and where the data sources, where you can collect your information for today. We just continue on building on that because once you understand the types of data that you're working on or you're working with, then you will be able to understand how do you visualize that information and what kind of a story you want to tell with that. They will guide your visualization design. And later on, we do have a visualization toolkit that you can also follow when you start looking at the type of data that you have, what type of a visualization visualization I want to develop to answer a certain question as well. So visualization is incorporated in different phases of the data analytics process. If you're not visualizing your data, sometimes you are missing those nuances that are hidden within your data. So we look at it from pre-processing to exploratory to presentation. Next, next slide, sorry. So during the data collection, if you are collecting your data and your data immediately is visualized, you will be able to see where the challenges are within your data. You can identify the areas where you still need to collect more information or the area where data is missing and you can correct it as soon as possible. In terms of cleaning your data, you will be able to identify those anomalies that are within your data and you can correct or apply some techniques to uh, rectify those anomalies. Next. In terms of integration, when we are collecting information from different sources and we're trying to merge and combine, sometimes there as well, by visualizing the type of information that you have will also help you to identify where the challenges are arising, whether is it through your ETL processes or your um, extraction and transformation and loading side of things that are happening, or is it uh, from one data source, or is it the linking of your data sources as well? Next, you can also use it through when you're doing your exploratory analysis. This is before if you are going to do predictive analytics by unpacking and describing your data and understanding the kind of data that you have so that it can inform you what type of uh, uh, predictive analytics you want to do. So through the data analysis, you put it into bars and charts so that you can see which uh, categories has the more the highest number or in terms of line chart, in terms of where the missing years are. By visualizing your data, you'll be able to also pick up those anomalies within your data during the analysis process. Next, you can also... Uh, use your data visualization in presentation when you are presenting your data because um, the data that you, you visualize through your analysis sometimes doesn't make sense to present it as it is to your audience. So you also need to come up with a, a visualization that will talk to the audience that you are presenting that information to as well. The last one, will be around the distribution, even when it is something that is automated, the data that is sitting on a table, if you are distributing an Excel file, uh, are you going to also include a pivot table with some charts that highlights a summary of that Excel, Excel sheet that you are distributing, or if you are distributing it through um, things like your um, power heater, your Power BI, your Tableau, any of the visualization uh, tools that exist. So you need to also think about uh, the type of visualization that you also need to present in those tools in order for your audience to be able to understand the data that you want to present. Next. Now I'm going to talk about the importance of um, making sense of the information and why we need to visualize the data because uh, if we have it in the table, it's, it, it's also okay. But sometimes when we visualize that data, we are able to identify areas that need improvement 
attention and we can put special attention to those areas. We are able to also identify immediately the relationships and patterns that exist within the data. We're able to also communicate the story to the other uh, um, stakeholders or to the other users. We are able to also reinforce the arguments around the data and the opinions that we have. We can also use that to, um, uh, uh, to look at the opinions that people are saying and um, look at those assumptions and see what the data is telling us because the minute it's visualized, you will be able to pick up. I've been always saying, when you visualize your data, it makes it easier for you to understand where your challenges are. But also it is as easy as a pie because when the purpose of doing a visualization in a nutshell is to either persuade someone to take action around that data, and that is what we want with the information from Sia Pumelela, the data that we're looking at to say, how do we take it back to our own institution and have a discussion and persuade someone to create interventions that are data driven? Or do we want to also inform someone to say, we have a challenge, uh, this is where the problem arises, but we know that if we just inform them, they might not take action around it. Or we want to explain some of the scenarios. Maybe probably there are some practices that are happening within your institution. You can use your data to highlight those and explain the reason why we need to change some of these processes and so on. And it is, it is as easy as that. Uh, next slide. In terms of visualization, you also need to be able to tell a good story with your visualization. So designing a report or a dashboard, a dashboard will involve a multi-step process that requires a clear understanding of why you need to, uh, to create that visualization or that dashboard, who are your target audience and what type of a data that it needs to be displayed. In terms of defining the purpose, we spoke about it is as easy as, as pie. Are you persuading someone? Are you informing them? Or are you trying to explain some phenomena? You need to choose the right metrics that you want to display on that chart or on that visualization. You also need to make sure that it is in a way that it's presentable and in a way that it is consistent. The presentation needs to also be consistent in terms of the color. I, I usually also say, if you are doing a presentation, and I work at UWC, our colors, our branding colors are blue and almost like goldish. I always say people, when they look at some of our dashboard, they need to uh, relate to them. They need to be to look at them and say, this is the UWC data. And the consistency around presenting that information, and it, it pulls through on all our visualization in all our reports that we are doing because we take into consideration the color, the constructs, uh, how we, we present. We also, you also need to remember that when you are doing those presentation, you eliminate the clutter, the noises. You make it easier for someone to understand what is happening on that chart or on that graph without them being confused or interpreting the information wrong. But if you also don't want to put too much information, you can also focus on your layout by giving some description of what is happening within that visualization or description in terms of the titles that we put on our visualization. Gone are those days where we just say gender. I know some of the examples in my slide will just have that one way, but we need to be able to describe uh, or help the user to understand what is happening within that visualization by putting a title that is meaningful uh, and people can understand and be able to interpret the visualization without uh, finding clarity around what is happening. You need to be able to tell a good story around your data uh, as well. So you need to put time, pilot it, prototype it before you start developing and also engage with your user and ask them what type of things that they would like to see before you start going all out and start developing nice dashboard that no one will understand and use. You need to also, it's, it's also about how will the user interact with your visualization.
as well. Next. So I'm going to move on to show you some of the example. I'm not saying you need to do it this way. There are best examples out there as well. I'm just highlighting some of the key elements based on what we just discussed now. So in terms of giving meaning to your data, you need to make sure that for every table that you are designing or you are developing or trying to visualize, it communicates valuable information in that by creating a visualization that makes sense or highlights. So let's say, for example, looking at the module um, pass rates table that you have, we all have that, we saw it last week, we discussed it last week. If I want to make sense of that table, I can visualize it by looking at the top 10 module pass rate, but because I want to put emphasis on two things, those that are performing low uh, between uh, within this top 10 and that module that is performing the best. So I'm only going to highlight those two modules and the others I'm going to create a uniform color. And in this instance, the minute you look at this visualization, it draws you to two points and it doesn't draw you to all 10 points that are on the screen. It draws your attention to the orange and the red. And that is where you're going to first look and say, oh, this module is performing the lowest, is this module and the next module um, is performing the highest is psych. And you can also make your, your other analysis out of it with by just muting the other noise that is around this. And this is one form of uh, create or communicating with your visuals. Next. The other way of communicating with your visual is by creating comparison. Let's say we want to look at the gender disparity. We will be able to take the same module pass rate and look at the visualization. And for here, I can already see uh, at the glance that the males are performing lower than the female. And here I'm comparing males and female. But what if I want next, what if I want to compare females across the 10 highest uh, um, modules? And in a way to simplify this, because I'm only looking at female student or I'm looking at male student uh, at a glance, and I can compare their performance within different modules. Let's assume that you are doing this analysis for one department. In order for that department, maybe their target um, analysis or their um, research is about addressing the gender gap within the department. In order for us to know which modules we need to concentrate on and put all our resources in, then we visualize it in the right-hand side manner so that then you see the distribution of the male performance and you can pinpoint and say, I want to select only the three top, uh, the three below module performance where males are not performing high. And I can pilot this project in that, in those three modules. And if things work well at the end of the semester and I can see some improvement, then I can then roll it out and scale it up to the rest of them. And in this manner, you are comparing uh, gender within across the modules as compared to the left where you are doing a comparison between males and females. Next. The other types of visualization that you can use are like your dashboard. A dashboard is where you take a collection of all the visualization, the individual multiple pieces of visualization that you've created and combine them on a central plane uh, on one page and visualize them. The most important thing about visualizing on your dashboard is as human beings, we are taught to read from left to right. So when you are telling that story, it, you need to make sure that the flow of your story on your visualization flows from left to right as well. So in, in this instance, my visualization is all over, but this is just an example of a dashboard where we have different pots that tells you the same story on one, um, on one view, where you are able to see the pass rate and if I want to disaggregate the pass rate by gender, I'm able to see that females and males, and in terms of females and males, I used a pictorial. Uh, the first one is a pie chart, the second one is a pictorial, and then the bar chart, which looks at the population group. Next, the 
<clears throat> Other types of visualization are like your infographics. With an infographics, you hone in onto that one specific aspect that you want to emphasize on. You don't have to create um, the population group, all the visualization for black, uh, black, white, Indian, colored, other. You only, if my target is to only look at undergraduate black students, then one of the key measure will just be on that visualization will just be undergrad uh, black success rate. Then I'm only concentrating on that one key important measure that I want to look at at that point. And that is what the um, infographics is. It's also a form of a dashboard, but it gives you one key measure that you want to draw attention to. Next. And that concludes what I wanted to share with you. Do not forget that there is a data visualization principle toolkit that will also give you the principle of data visualization. It expands on everything that I spoke about. It will help you when you are developing your next visualization for next week. In the breakout session now or room, we need to go and look at the module pass rate that you have completed per institution. All institutions would have completed their own module pass rate template the Excel template that we asked you to complete, you're going to take that template, you're going into that breakout room and discuss what is the purpose of the data visualization that you can create from that template. You need to look at who will be your target audience in, when you are creating that visualization. Who are you creating it for? Are you going to be creating it for the executive? Or are you going to be creating it for the faculties or for the student success committees or for anyone who needs information around the module pass rate? Think about your target audience. What kind of graphical display would you be developing from based on that? I've showed you some of my examples, but I've also given you the toolkit. You can go and look at the type of um, visualization that you can create, whether are you creating a line chart or are you going to create trends or you're going to do comparison of two numerical values. It's up to you to discuss those. Uh, if, you, if you said the purpose of the visualization was to inform, what must it inform your audience about? If you said it's to persuade them, what is it going to persuade them to do? Is it to explain something or to act on it. And the last, bit, the last bit of this is about the next steps. So we will talk about it when we, we come back after the next presentation, uh, which we say next week when we meet, you need to come back with your visualization or your stories that you can tell out of those five KPIs. Um, Ashton is the rooms created. Are there any questions before you go to the breakout rooms? There is no template oh, that you need. You already have those templates. We can scroll down to the bottom. Yes, Gulu Lego. Morning, morning, all. Lego from Unisa here. Question: So the discussion around visual visualizations, you'd like it to be limited to the data that you asked us to capture on the spreadsheet, right? Yes. Nothing more. Nothing more. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so this is the scenario that you're going to be, or the activity that you're going to be discussing uh, in the breakout room. It's the same using the completed module pass rate data that you have disaggregated by your preferred dimensions. So we asked you, if you know that race is not a dimension that you need to be using, don't use that. Maybe you have gender, quintile income status, module type, we gave you all that to say, you can go and disaggregate it any way you want. Uh, and then you're going to answer those questions and then we'll come back and do a repeat after a break, we'll come back and do a repeat um, uh, report back.
and each individual university, now we're not going to say a group group, individual university will tell us about their data. Thank you. You can now move to the breakout rooms. Okay, so we've got eight groups. Uh, <clears throat> so we're going to do a repeat report. Uh, key takeaways from the discussions uh, based on the discussion of today in terms of visualization, what you have learned, what other people can take away from uh, your own institution, what are the best practices that you have in terms of visualization in your own institution uh, based on the discussion that you just had now within that 30 minutes of breakout room. Um, you can raise your hand if you want me to acknowledge you and talk, or I will just go around the room and pick the breakout room by name. Okay, Yunisa wants to go first. Let's go. Th thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to share my screen quickly. I know you said you'd like us to be brief. So uh, ma manage us, please. We might be problematic. So we had fascinating discussions and I hope you can see my screen. Lots of ideas. Um, the key takeaway, the, 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 the most important takeaway is that when developing a visualization, you've got to imagine being the user and then assess what is it that I can give the user to help them identify the key insights as quickly as possible. And that's really our principle when developing a visualization. So first thing that we had already done when we prepared is that even with this table, we immediately just applied some conditional formatting, right? So after capturing our information, we applied some conditional formatting and, and there were insights that jumped out at us immediately. We were able to compare the enrollments by module and then we were able to identify the modules at a total level that are most problematic, and then also identify which race groups uh, had problems in terms of your passage. So already just conditional formatting on a matrix, on a table is very strong because it helps deliver that insight. But there are also some other awesome ideas, right? To say, if we're going to be delivering this to an executive, we want to have a full picture and, and help them contextualize the insights as much as possible. So a dashboard option as opposed to a single individual uh, visualization might be strong because then you're able to colorate, colorate, uh, correlate certain insights, right? Then we mentioned how important it is that a simple bar column chart when you're comparing figures, is very, very important. Combination charts, we discussed that because sometimes you don't want to only look at the percentage in isolation. You want to look at that percentage and then the relative size of that module so that you have context about where your deepest problems are, right? We discussed having KPI charts because they then pull in time intelligence. If we've got 87%, is that, is that great? But if we compare that to what we had last period, if it's a 10% drop, then there's a problem, right? So having that kind of time intelligence is very, very important. We also spoke about mark distribution, right? Because if I'm at a 62%, but all my failures are hopeless, versus a 62%, but all my failures are sitting at 40 to 45%, then you can see that even with the same pass rate, the problems might be different because of the distribution of, of your marks. And finally, we thought about, okay, we're looking at this table. What single in, uh, visualization could bring all of this together? And we believe we could do that with a scatter plot. Okay, imagine this, having a scatter plot, pass rate on the y-axis, enrollment on the x-axis, number of passes determining the size of the bubble, and then we color code each bubble by race, right? With that, you'll be able to see all the problems. What problematic race is, where are your pass rates that are the highest, lowest with the re relative size. So a scatter plot in my, in our view, would be the strongest visual to bring everything together. But the aim is not to cluster everything. A dashboard gives you the ability to pull uh, uh, different visuals together so that you have that context and you're able to cross correlate. Thanks, thanks colleagues. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, UCT. 
Um, I just want to say thank you so much to Eunice now because we learned so much. I don't know how much time they had, but we only had half an hour. So we first went high level and looked at the questions on the activity. And then we also went back and looked at um, our data that we worked on this week. So in terms of the purpose of the data visualization, whether we want to inform, explain or persuade, um, we initially said that we want to inform, um, but um, once the story um, sort of emerges from the data, I think we might want to persuade. So I think that's just up to discussion stall. Um, and then in terms of the target audience, we thought that we would rather present to faculty because um, executive at higher would, would need higher level data. Um, for instance, program level data, they might request that. So I think with what we have, we feel more comfortable that we can present to faculty on that data. Um, and then in terms of the graphic displays, um, I think we went the shortcut, we looked at the, the dashboard and it would be amazing, but to pull something together, I think we were thinking about next week, um, we would definitely look at more static displays and, and keeping it simple so that we can actually apply the underlying principles of, you know, the coloring, drawing the eye to the right place. I think all three of us are quite new to this. So I think we just want to get the basics right first. Um, and then um, we saw similar storyline appear as what Unisa had, um, the, that they possibly might be a, a race, that there are specific uh, race demographic that is struggling more. Um, with the subjects that we have, we have the hypothesis that it, it might be an underlying mathematics thing. So it's also just looking at that and looking at what is the um, access required, admission requirements for those things. Um, also want to look at whether uh, they have to write MBTs. So we think there's a quantitative literacy aligned to the three um, subjects that are listed as the highest fail rate or the, or the lowest pass rate. Um, and yeah, so we think that might be what we will be informing the audience about. But I think we're going to get more into those KPIs in the, the next session. That's it from us. Thank you. Uh, the combined group, UWC. Um, yes, um, for us, we looked into the questions that we uh, were provided to discuss. So um, instead, we chose to um, inform and explain our data visualization, reason being it will be able to give um, the target audience the trends and their um, insights, more information on what, um, on on what they could uh, make an informed decision on, or where can they improve in terms of the high priority modules that um, uh, they will be looking at. And then the target audience will be our um, departments, faculties, maybe student support as well, because it will be able to give them the guidance on um, which students to look into and then which students provide support. Um, if we chose, if we um, provide them to the, the data to the student support, student support will be able to give us the feedback on uh, the challenges that students have and then students will be able to guide us on where they need um, improvement. In terms of the graphic display, uh, we chose to do with the bar graph because bar graph, it, it, we are able to identify the race, gender and the income statement using the bar graph. So it will give more of a visualization information from the bar graph. Um, the reason why uh, we chose to inform the audience about this type of data, for instance, if we look at the socioeconomic status, um, some students come from the disadvantaged background, some they're using NSFASIS, so it's more likely for some of those students to have challenges in terms of um, their modules pass rate, so therefore that would be able to give their target audience more information on the insights. And if there's anyone in our team who would want to add more as well. Okay. Thank you, combined group. Uh, CUT. Um, thank you so much. So uh, yeah, we also had a great conversation. Uh, we decided that uh, we can use this data to explain, inform and persuade and that, that the this would probably be dependent on what the target audience is. And for that, we spoke about it could be for management, our SRC, the different faculty representatives and all of the academic support unit, as well as external stakeholders. 
for the graphic displays, we uh, like the idea of having a dashboard or an infographic, uh, perhaps with some color coded pivot tables at the bottom that still has all of the data so that you can reference back to the data if you need to. But then at the top, we'll have colorful graph bars uh, and human icon widgets where you have the different races with um, their percentages in. Uh, and uh, for what we will inform the audience about is um, most probably it's going to be for funding. Uh, that's what we almost always use our data for, unfortunately, but also whether or not interventions are needed or whether we want to report back on interventions already conducted and showcase those results. It's also a great way to highlight, highlight progress for external funders like DHEAD or so on um, and showing them where we are at with our projects. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Sorry, I'm, I'm, I need to see whose hand is up. Uh, okay, no one's hand is up. One. Olivia, your hand is getting tired. Stellenbosch? Okay, while Stellenbosch is still thinking through, or Sulu? Uh, good morning, colleagues. Firstly, um, the first question we we did is to inform the management, explain to them of what is happening in order for them to persuade the academic. And um, the second question, we're looking at pass rate per module. Uh, so we're looking at faculty and and department. And in terms of the of the charts. Um, creating the charts. So we, we, we thought of uh, creating the bar chart because it's easy, it's easy to be understandable when you explain, um, when you inform the, the, the management about the performance of modules at risk, um, which are not performing well. Um, in terms of uh, target market, uh, the number four question, is to inform the the the, the management the 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 deans exec, uh, I mean HODs about the performance and even environment. Um, um, we're talking about the pass rate at this point in time, so we inform them about the performance of those uh, particular modules. So it pushes about what will they think about their uh, their practice. Um, thank you. Sorry. I think let's go with Stellenbosch since they are back and she is in front of me. Stellenbosch. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I should have kept quiet now. It's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we started out with uh, that we will use the visualization to explain um, and then we will definitely be that the target group will definitely be stakeholders from different environments working within one faculty so maybe lecturers the learning and teaching team the students um, academic advisors um, that will be the the stakeholders um, and then so we had modules from from different faculties in our top 10 um, high impact modules, but we said we will start with um, an overall of these 10 modules, what are the 10 modules, and then depending on the faculty, zoom in from there um, on those faculties. And then we had a, a, a um, discussion on what will we use for to differentiate um, within this module, you know, is race the correct thing? Uh, do we want to use um, grade 12 mathematics performance? And it depends on what you want to do with the data. Um, we decided to use a bar chart because we're going to zoom in and we're not going to try to put all the data in one bar chart. Um, and then we said the data will be really helpful so that we know where to focus our interventions on. Uh, we don't have endless resources. So if we know, okay, this is where where the, re the interventions are most needed, um, that that is very useful. And that is what the visualization will help us with. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, VUT. Okay, from VUT. 
we uh, looked at the four questions. I think in terms of number one, uh, all three um, options uh, applies. We'd like to inform, uh, explain, and with the ultimate goal to uh, persuade the stakeholders that we will be presenting the data to, uh, to take and make some um, appropriate uh, interventions based on the data that we have presented to them or informed them. Uh, uh, because we looked at those high impact modules, uh, the enrollment, their pass rate, and also the, um, some information around the aggregated information. So, um, and then the second one, we looked, the stakeholders would be, of course, the DVC, who's overseeing um, uh, the teaching and learning activities, the academics, um, and HODs and deans and the um, support services, like um, the Center for Academic Development and also the SRCs. So those would be our stakeholders that we will be presenting to. Um, and in terms of how we would be presenting the data, we looked at um, two um, graphs. One would be the pie chart and the other one would be uh, the the bar graph so that they could uh, would be able to uh, to visualize them and present them into a graphic format for the audience to be able to follow and understand what we are trying to show them um, and uh, the last one uh, of course they are uh, because of the many underlying factors that could contribute towards um, the, the 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 high impact modules uh, that will uh, basically affect many other things that could be also some could be the uh, subsidy uh, some could be the enrollment itself because if students are not uh, able to progress uh, with um, the um, workload that have been provided it will ultimately affect in terms of uh, how many students in the coming year can the institution uh, accept? Uh, also, uh, it talks to uh, the number of like workload also for the staff members uh, that would be uh, offering those modules, and the success rate itself and the throughput rate for the for the institution. So those are the things that we have basically highlighted. Uh, based on the four questions that we have been provided with. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Last group, SMU. Last, but hopefully not least. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we are the smallest university in any case. So um, when we looked at the question and looked at our data, first, uh, what I want to highlight is um, of our te top 10 uh, modules, Six of them um, come from the School of Science and Technology, that's your physics, biology, chemistry, and math-related modules. But across the departments or schools, um, we also identified the module of, um, what is it, anatomy as problematic. Uh, there are a few anatomy modules there which um, had were, were high risk. And in fact, if we expand our high-risk modules beyond the top 10, we see other modules whose knowledge or mastery depends on anatomy. They are also high-risk um, high modules. So for that, we thought um, we are going to uh, use a bar chart to visualize um, these modules we are at, which are at risk and also just to indicate the severity of the problem in relation to the other modules. And um, we are then going to try and persuade um, the, the deans, HOD lecturers, support departments, um, these are now our stakeholders. We're trying to persuade them to um, look at um, the problems, right, uh, comprehensively, try to review for example, uh, are there curriculum issues? Are there staff student ratio issues? And um, and also try to persuade uh, the stakeholders to make use of the uh, support services that we offer. So um, yeah, that's that's more or less what we we thought we'd do then. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before I hand over to Charles, um, um, I think Alan, you can start sharing your screen. <clears throat> Or oh, is it Charles who's going to share? 
Um, just to wrap up the, the session and, and give some key takeaways, are there any two questions or two comments or one comment that anyone wants to raise before we close off the session? Um, going once, going twice, no comments, no questions. And thank you for participating and uh, sharing your your knowledge with us. I think I've got two takeaways from this um, and from all the discussions that we had today. It's about building the right context in terms of when you're doing those visualization. And also um, one or two people missed out on also getting this information at a disaggregated level to the executive. The executive have been seeing this data for a very long time, but no action has been, oh, there is minimal action because the data is not disaggregated. We're not highlighting this pattern. So when you go back to your own institution, also think executives as part of your audience that really needs to see where the challenges are so that if you don't have executive buy-in, there would be no funds for those interventions. And therefore, for you to get those funds so that you can have those right interventions to support those modules, they need to know exactly what is happening in your own institution, not at a high level only, but at a lowest level as well. Thank you very much. Over to you, Charles. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I just want to add something <clears throat> about visualization. The interesting thing is we have to report four times a year to council on the key performance indicators. And <clears throat> we have gone the route of developing infographics, thematic infographics. The first one of the year is all about enrollments, where our students come from, what they look like. The second infographics is all about student success, uh, graduates, etc. The third one about transformation. And the last one is about sustainability. So we've developed these infographics. It gives the council an immediate overview of exactly what's going on in the university. And it's, it's really very popular and user-friendly. Uh, that is just beside the point. Uh, I'm going to talk about the student success key performance indicators. Uh, we have to report to Krishki on, as you know, Siapumilele is basically data-based. We must use data to inform our student success interventions. And we have developed a template on, on four basic student key performance indicators that the participating institutions complete. And then I develop a comparative report for Kreshki. Uh, but uh, the important point is it's not to compare the institutions with one another, but rather over the years that you implement your student success initiatives, what are the changes happening within your institution? In other words, are you making progress? You are your only uh, reference point. It's it's not a way of comparing institutions because we know institutions are so different and they serve such different uh, audiences of students. Thanks. Next slide. <clears throat> the first one is the retention of first time entering undergraduate students from study year one to study year two enrolled in three and four year B degrees including three-year undergraduate diplomas by population, group, and gender. We know that the biggest point where students drop out, if you look at all cohort studies throughout the years, and I've been doing cohort studies for the CHE for 11 years now, for all qualification types and all universities, and you can always see the biggest dropout is in your first year. So it's very important that we retain our first-time entering students that is uh, where we could lose most of them. And this is our first indicator for student success. Next one. So here's just an example. What we look at is, for instance, this is the percentage, the yellow bars are the percentage of 2022 first time entering code returning in 2023 and we look at it by population group. The important thing is here, when I do the calculation for my university, I look at the occasional students I exclude because they, we don't expect them to return. And then higher 
higher certificates, you need to look at how many of them have graduated and haven't returned. They are still successful. They were not expected to return. So then I, I get the group out that are expected to return who haven't uh, passed the, the higher certificate, who haven't obtained the qualification. But also some of those that have obtained also return. So you need to make a very careful analysis to sift out which students you expected to return and how, what percentage of them did actually return the next year. And you can do that for more than one year to see how things are progressing. And if you split it by population group and female and male, it makes it much more meaningful to see where the problem areas are. Then the next one, thanks. The second one is the success rates of undergraduate students enrolled in three and four year B degrees and three year diplomas by population group, gender, and you can also add faculty. The success rate is defined as the completed full-time equivalence expressed as a percentage of the enrolled full-time equivalence. So what is the difference? I think you all know what a success rate is. It, in a sense, tells you what percentage of the credits that the student was enrolled for did the student pass or the students pass. So it also gives a sense of um, how far students have progressed in completing a qualification. It's different from a pass rate in the fact that because it works on credits, it weigh the modules within the calculation. So a module with a bigger credit value will have more impact on what the success rate is. It will influence the success rate more, but it's quite an easy calculation to make and it's very meaningful. Thank you. The next one. And then we are especially interested to look at the success rate of first time entering undergraduate students uh, because they are the one that that needs to adjust to the higher education um, environment and normally experience a lot of problems. You can see quite the difference in, in performance of the different population groups and female and male. And the aim of this is, of course, that we want to get everyone to the same level of performance. We want to close the gaps in performance. That is the aim of, of academic uh, success interventions. The next one. And then indicator three, this is the one that you've actually used in your exercise, the tracking of high impact modules, uh, their, their module pass rate. The module pass rate is the percentage of students who pass the examination of uh, sorry, this is Spelling error, I'll check it out, but to pass the examination of the total number of initial registrations at the last date for registration changes. High impact modules are defined as low pass rates and re relatively high enrollments. But I've mentioned last time that sometimes universities have their own definition of what they see as high impact modules. And in the reporting, we allow people to actually describe to us how they identify their high impact modules and then report on that. The idea is, of course, that the university should have interventions to improve the pass rates of high impact modules because in the end, they impact on your throughput rates, your graduations, your number of graduates that you produce, and in the end, also your teaching output subsidy, which is very important. Thanks. Next one. And then the more complicated one, the indicator for the throughput rates for undergraduate three-year diplomas, three-year degrees, and four-year degrees. And originally, we only asked for the graduates in minimum time. But when you actually look at all the cohort studies, you will see that a very large percentage of students graduate in the year just after minimum time, minimum time plus one year, and also in minimum time plus two years. After that, the number of students that graduate becomes very low. But so it's also important to look at those, those two. And it also has NISVAS implications because they only get funded for minimum time plus one year. 
so one can track whether that's got quite an impact because it's quite a loss if students would have just needed a, another year to complete their status and they drop out and then you you lose it. Yeah, I see UNISA makes a comment. It's very complex for them. That's fully understandable. And of course, their minimum time cannot be the same as ours because these students study part-time and take much longer to graduate. So obviously UNISA will have to look at throughput rates over a much longer period. And I know students come in and out. UNISA is a very different uh, scenario. Thanks. The next one. Okay, uh, is there more slides, Alan, or is that the last one? Okay, there's just some a show of the throughput rates of three undergraduate diplomas. What is the overall throughput? You can see in minimum time it was 27% of the students graduated, and then uh, um, plus two years, you can see how it shoots up to 56%. So that's why we now like to track in our templates minimum time, minimum time plus one, and minimum time plus two, because it just makes sense. We just know that so many of our students take more than minimum time to complete. Thanks. Next one. That could be the last slide. Yeah. Okay, so we, we're also going to have breakaway sessions. There are some questions. I don't know if that can come up. I think, as I recall, the, the one is that you must go and talk about these four indicators that we've identified. Also, obviously, there could have been many more, but the point is that we also wanted to make it simple. And even, even as the template stands now, it is quite a lot of work to compile the data. Ask me, I looked at it and thought, you, what have we done when I have to complete them for, for submission to Sadie and Krishki? Um, so your institution is part of a collaborative initiative aimed at improving student success across multiple universities. The project involves analyzing data from four key student success indicators that will contribute to a comprehensive integrated report for Krishki at the end of each funding cycle. And um, the, the task now, just to go and look at, review the four provided student success indicators Will these indicators be able to inform your student success initiatives? Why or why not? Reflect on how these indicators can be integrated into your current institutional strategies for enhancing student success. And analyze whether you currently have all the necessary data for the provided and proposed indicators. If not, what are the challenges in collecting it? Okay, we're not actually asking first generation students, as was suggested here because we realized a lot of universities don't have that data. And just the question, could that be introduced in future years? Uh, develop a plan for improving data collection processes where gaps exist. And then identify trends and tell a data story using the available data, examine any trends or patterns that stand out. What trends do you observe from the data I have? We have emailed, Ashton have emailed you a completed template, which was the uh, Achieving the Dream template, which is a bit complex, but it's interesting. The, if you look at it, it can be at the template much simpler. And then also you can design a visualization that effectively, effectively conveys these trends and supports your narrative. So what this is also coming to, we just want you to look at these four so, uh, student success indicators, see whether they're going to be useful. Indicate to us, is there maybe another one that we've overlooked that's also very important? And then you can look at the completed data, uh, data template and see what trends of data comes out of it. Uh, the point is for next time, and Elizabeth and I will come back to it, is that we want you to go and choose any one that you would like 
and develop your data, develop a visual, and come and tell us a story about it. It's not to say that you must do it on all four of these indicators. That will be too much work. But you can choose one that you feel uh, you would like to, to expand on and come and discuss. Okay, so yeah, uh, I'm just going to quickly share. I don't know. I just want to share the template quickly uh, with them. You see this a bit small there. This is just a completed one with a success rate by gender. And you can look at um, how useful this is and um, what are the differences, what data trends do you see. Then there's the three year program retention rate. This is where we look at the students that were enrolled, for instance, in 2015 that returned in 2016. And you can also do it by gender, race, quintiles, schools, first generation status. This is just to show you a template that was developed by Achieving the Dream. If you want to use it in your own institution, it's very interesting because it calculates here at the bottom for your differences between the different population groups and gender, which can very quickly show to you what are the gaps that you need to, to work in, in narrowing. And then there's a four-year program retention rate um, and then a throughput rates for three-year programs. And again, if you go scroll down on this template, you can see the differences between the different population groups in terms of percentage points in throughput rates. Very interesting, a bit complex. It took me a while to interpret it properly, but this is I'm just providing to you if you would like to go and use it in your own institution. So I think that's it um, before you can go into the groups and discuss those questions that have been given. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Yeah, uh, Unisa, you've got a question. Yeah, I just wanted to confirm that I understood what you mentioned. So you're saying in our reporting commitment to the funders, yeah. these are the key. These are the four key measures that we've committed. Yes, it was jointly decided by the partner universities who originally participated in Siapumilele, and we developed the templates jointly. We've made it much simpler than this particular one that I'm giving as an example. Uh, I think it has been sent out to all institutions. Uh, but that was the key ones that we decided on. And as I say, the, the idea is not to compare you with other universities, but to compare yourself over time of how things are changing. Look, the measures themselves are very, very strong. It's just, yes, our scenario is quite unique. Yes. If we have recommendations for adjustments or incorporations or exclusions or whatever are we still open for that or is the commitment set in stone i think for unisa you can absolutely come back to us and make suggestions and we can look at that hopefully it will be on the same kind of the same indicators but maybe you would want to report it in a different way a uh, different template different period of time because that's quite understandable. Yeah, because really the, the, the challenge here is centered around in our systems, are there attributes that are declared that enable this kinds of analysis? If the attributes are there, we, mm -hmm. we're able to do it. If not, then we may come in and say this might be a challenge because the official, whether a student has stopped out, dropped out, whatever the case may be, a lot of mm -hmm. this we're trying to derive from the data but might not necessarily be specifically declared um, in order to make the analysis easy. So I wanted to just say that up front. Yeah. I must just again indicate like that the I, Achieving the Dream template has got proposals in of uh, quintile schools and first generation. We don't ask that in our template. We've made it much simpler. Uh, we just stick to population group and gender mostly. 
in some universities, even population group doesn't really make sense because there's not really a big presentation, representation of all population groups in particular universities. But we've made it much simpler than that particular template. Thanks. Can I just say that um, the, the um, MOA that was signed by your institution does include these indicators, but that doesn't mean that we can't have a conversation in the convening meeting that is in next month, early next month, we are going to have a discussion about what we are going to report on and how. And that will be um, a, a large part of what we need to do because at the moment, the uh, narrative reports can come up to 20 pages and uh, Sadie has to evaluate that. So now if you take 20 pages by 20 institutions, how long do you think it's going to take us to do that? So we want to make it shorter, more direct, and we need to have a discussion about how to do the data. Hmm. Yeah, I think in any, in any case, all universities are able to report on these four indicators. I think my only... A suggestion is that with UNISA, we might need to look at the period of reporting because for their throughput rates, they would need more years to report on, etc. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And again, ours is really, we want to align uh, most certainly. We support this initiative. It's just perhaps the timing of the involvement of the data experts. I mean, if we're involved at MOA, we might have made some contributions, but we are where we are now, and hopefully we are able to align 100%. It's just, yeah, there might be some nuances that mm -hmm. make it challenging for us to align 100%. Yeah. You know, Not a problem. I, I just want to make a, 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 a maybe a silly uh, thing. If by using data, you improve the throughput rate, by 1% at UNISA, what impact will that have in the South African system? I mean, oh, it will oh, be my, massive. Oh, my goodness. I mean, we handle over 400,000 students on average every year. Jeez, 1% yeah, exactly. is a big number. Exactly. Yeah. Even if it's 0.5%. Indeed. Okay, you want to go into the, the rooms? Yes. Uh, you just need to, I'm going to excuse myself for a while. No problem, we will be here. Thank you. Charles, are you still in this group? Yes. I just want to check what what data are we, is being referred to in the activity. Uh, there was a um, the Excel spreadsheet that was emailed. Yes. Just to look at, but there are other questions actually to discuss the usefulness of the indicators proposed. To, for institutions to indicate whether they will be able to provide the information, which I think they should be able to. Uh, I just don't know if all universities are that strong on throughput rate analyses, uh, but basically to com comment on them, the usefulness, whether they will be able to supply the data. And, and if there's a major one that we've overlooked on student success that could be added yeah, that's basically it. And they can look at the data, but to those templates and comment on it. That's all. Okay. So, so, but when you say the data from the templates, did you share that? When did was that shared? Yeah, sorry, I think there is a, uh, uh, a difference of uh, understanding. Yes. They have, they have developed their own data in what we gave them last time. Yeah. And Charles is now just say, showing them other ways, but they need to use their original data. Yeah, SMU didn't actually, they just identified the 10 modules, but there's nothing beyond that. There's no like gender analysis. Um, the only point they made was that uh, 
race won't really work for them because I think they they like pretty much hundred percent you know um, black African. But so we don't really have a lot of like institutional data to work with. Yeah, but then they can use other data, um, um, uh, about male and female, for instance. They don't have. They didn't do provide that data. No, well, that's the problem. We told them that they must look at yeah. that. So maybe if you go back to them, say that this is what they need to do. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Charles, I think Alan is not here, so you take over. I'm back. Oh, you back? Okay. Yes. Um, I'll just share the the last bit. Okay, uh, I think uh, uh, I think so. We're going to give everybody or the eight group the opportunity to give us some feedback and ideas. Um, the first thing is uh, just to to see, to hear from you whether you agree with the indicators, whether there's one that you thought we should have added, but just remember if you add, it's more work, more data work for you to report on. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's an uh, interesting one that we can also look into. And then, uh, will they be useful for you as an institution as well? And do you have the data available to calculate these indicators? And if not, what needs to be done? And then, uh, if you looked at that template of uh, achieving the dream, uh, did you see in anything interesting, any interesting observations or trends? And uh, yeah, uh, let's start. Anyone who wants to go first, or shall I just call groups? Can we start with Unisa again? Okay. Yeah, in, in, indeed. To go, we, we, we probably were in a lot of need of a coach in this session, and we looked around and no one was to be found. So thanks for leaving us on our own, uh, Charles. We thought you'd be back. But I think we're fine. We... Look, we're going to need more time on this. That's our feedback. Um, we ended up having a lot of discussion around the source of the information that we would use internally to provide this feedback. Um, we do have <laughs> modules. Okay, I'm getting some feedback, colleagues. Okay. I think somebody had unmuted. Yeah, so um, we do have some um, uh, analytics modules and semantic modules that are capable of providing the information. So if we can provide it, yes, definitely. But again, we'll come back to the complexity of deriving these figures. Um, I think we just, what we're going to do is we're going to get together and just give each other some comfort around how our current analytics modules are running the calculations and confirming if they align with the business rules that you have incorporated into these templates. So the template's certainly useful. Uh, you know, they, 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 they make sense in terms of, you know, what, what we're trying to achieve. Um, for us, it's just going to be a matter of saying to what extent can we align with the business rules uh, that you incorporated into these templates when compared to what we currently have. And, and we'll certainly have feedback um, at a later stage, but we couldn't get to a point to have feedback. And we didn't even get to the achieving the dream part. Apologies for that. That's our feedback. Thank you. No, thank you. Sorry, I wanted to join your group, but when I tried to join the group, I was thrown out of Zoom. Somebody was angry. Oh, I see. I see. <laughs> but we can always consult later. Uh, Rodney from BUT, would you like to go? Uh, thank you. Yes, we just wanted to uh, um, share what uh, uh, how uh, what our discussion was with regard to this. Uh, the indicators we looked at those indicators, and uh, uh, from our side, 
we are very comfortable with those indicators and we can be able to um, uh, uh, provide um, uh, a data because we do have data source that contains uh, that, that kind of information. Um, we also looked at um, some other challenges that might be in, in terms of the data uh, data collection. Uh, sometimes we have uh, you know challenges where we have units that have got data but they are working in silos. And I think with with that we can be able to uh, come up with some kind of uh, 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 arranged meetings with those departments that we can work together. So that we can be able to collect that data from their uh, from their section and use it into uh, into uh, uh, the whole uh, 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 student success project. Um, and um, just to look, I, we didn't look at the template, we just looked in, into our data currently, what is what is actually happening there, just to tell a story in terms of, for example, one of those indicators, which is your student retention. We also learned that uh, from that, we have a very low retention rate of our first, uh, first time entering students. And that has been addressed in, uh, 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 to the institution in many in many uh, uh, other meetings, uh, yeah, it's something that is of a high concern uh, to our university because of that. And um, we also appreciated to, to use that uh, uh, a template, which which was um, uh, for the previous exercise with the high impact uh, modules. Uh, that data also we do have it, and um, uh, uh, although we couldn't uh, in terms of uh, arrays. Uh, we don't have that much representation of, um, of 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 other races, so mostly it's African. So we're planning to maybe use other other uh, other indicators there, like uh, gender, uh, uh, maybe quintile, which is something that also might be a challenge because we don't have that kind of information. Maybe uh, uh, buzzery, uh, maybe buzzery uh, uh, information and then residence and all that we can also use uh, to 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 to. to, to to, to, to analyze our high impact modules in terms of those uh, at the pass rates. And then also we look at the throughput rates there. Uh, also, uh, we've got a very uh, low throughput rates and uh, we also realized that our student actually complete in minimum time plus two. Most of uh, our high percentage of uh, throughput is basically on the minimum plus two. The minimum plus one uh, is still low. Uh, minimum time is very, 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 very low. So that is also a concern, as you also mentioned, that that could have an impact on funding, especially with the NFSS, with the minimum plus one uh, 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 situation. Um, yeah, I think that's what, that's what we, we we have for, uh, for, for this activity. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of us see that our students actually need one or two additional years to complete. It's generally like that in the whole system. Okay, CUT, I think, was first answer, and then after that, we'll take you, Jane. <clears throat> CUT? Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, I think we also had a very lengthy discussion. Uh, we couldn't get to, to question three, but we looked at the, uh, at the indicators. Uh, we found them all useful, but we... We, I think we agreed that in terms of uh, the indicators, the tracking on, on the high impact modules and looking at the retention rates could actually help us to, um, you know, with our institutional strategies for enhancing student success, we agreed that this data would then help us to put a focus on how we look after our first entering students and how they are tracked throughout the system. This data is available to us. Uh, we are currently using it. Um, and uh, we are also working on the tracking on, on the high impact models, looking at the different interventions that we can put in to support our students. Some of the things that we also uh, discussed was information that we should um, collect uh, in terms of enhancing what we want to do around student success. Um, and we, we, you know, it was on question two that do we have all the data needed for these indicators? I think we agreed that there is some data that is uh, missing on first generation students. Um, there's data missing on whether um, there are challenges with digital literacy 
And it took us into a discussion around um, using survey to collect that additional um, data challenges that are linked with, um, with surveys and the response rate in terms of the surveys. And we, we spoke of strategies in terms how, of how we can improve the response rate by students, uh, the timing. I think we spent some time on, on that to say, when do we administer the survey? For example, we have a, a readiness survey that we usually administer at the beginning of the year. And there were suggestions that perhaps during registration, but also during uh, orientation that we can you know, speak with the students um, uh, during that time about the surveys. But we, we were mindful that we have to be careful with, with too much surveys and survey fatigue and that we have to ensure that the surveys are not too long, uh, speak to those key dat uh, data points that we, we are looking for, and also some incentives to encourage students to, to participate, uh, communication via um, uh, emails and social media to make students aware about the, the survey. So our, our conversation was really on, on the survey and also testing out the survey in advance in terms of a pilot to see um, its feasibility before it is administered. But uh, yes, uh, I think that's where the, the discussion went. Thank you very much. I think it's my turn now, um, Jay. You did say UJ yes, is next, although uh, it's not UJ, but the combined group, I think that- um, Thanks, to that I was part of. So that was a colleague from the University of the Western Cape, as well as two okay. colleagues from uh, no, Salt Lake University. Um, so we spent a lot of time talking to Elizabeth, actually, <laughs> about the indicators, because I was trying to understand how they are being discussed. And uh, in the brief that we were given, I don't know why the... Um, the website or the the uh, the screen is no longer reflecting activity too, um, but the activity itself didn't list the indicators, and for a long time I actually struggled to understand uh, why one would distinguish between the pass rate and the degree credit success rate until I looked at your presentation as a first time attendee of one of these sessions. I didn't realize that I could still look at your presentation, so I have more clarity on this. Um, I think from our perspective, we all agree that these indicators are useful at least for understanding where problem areas may lie in student success. Um, but we did, or I raised the issue with, uh, with Elizabeth that how we define these indicators might differ. So at UJ, we don't refer to the pass rate at all when, we ref when we're reporting on module data and so on. We only refer to the success rate. And I think it's a matter of terminology and not necessarily um, us referring to something very different. Um, so I do think that where we use success rate, you are obviously referring to pass rate. And then the degree credit success rate, as Elizabeth explained, um, does take into account how a student's load impacts on their, um, their success. Uh, and then, yes, we agree that the throughput rate and the retention rates are both important. Um, so minimum time to completion rate, I think that's what you mean by throughput rate, uh, you know, in minimum, minimum time is a good indicator of how well students are able to progress with the, through their qualifications. And by the way, in order for a student to um, complete a three-year degree in three years, they need to register for 100% of their modules and they need to pass 100% of those modules in that three-year period of time, uh, which is quite a difficult thing to achieve, but we need to keep that in mind when we are thinking about how the degree credit success rate might articulate into the throughput rate. Um, so all three institutions agreed that these indicators are valuable, but we were worried, or I am particularly worried about how we bring in other data fields that aren't necessarily part of the standard suite of reporting. And yeah, I'm thinking specifically of first gen students. It's not like we can, you know, obtain verifiable data on this. We rely on the testimony of students um, through, you know, be it surveys or even interviews uh, to get accurate information on who is a first gen and who is not a first gen student. And I also wondered to what extent every single first gen student will be willing to declare the fact 
that they are indeed first gen students because they might be worried about um, discrimination in some way, uh, you know, against them. So for us, gathering accurate data on first gen students is problematic. And I also wonder whether or not this question isn't referring to first time entering students instead, which I think is a far more valuable indicator than first gen students, just because we can verify um, through the data that we capture that a student hasn't entered into a program previously, either at UJ or at another university. So first time entering is a much better, I think, indicator of of um of that and then lastly there is the question of um what sorry to you know what trends do we observe i mean how to tell the data story so part of the reason why i would be very hesitant to tell a dean that you know first gen students in a faculty are underperforming is because i can't verify that and as an executive you know she would need very accurate information on you know, who is a first-gen student and who is not. And as I say, we do not have that in our, at our disposal. But first time entering would certainly be valuable to a dean uh, because they would then know this is a first year who hasn't studied anywhere else um, and they are struggling on average or whatever the case may be. So we, we agree that this information is valuable. Um, but again, terminology and the way these things are defined is problematic. And as a footnote, if I may say, uh, I do... It does concern me that we are looking at population indicators like race and gender um, in, in this scenario, and I understand why, but if we are intervening and where I work, that is why we analyze data. It's to ultimately identify where to intervene. We cannot profile people racially, and we cannot profile them in terms, in terms of gender, and we also can't direct academic interventions into student success to particular genders or race groups, because that is discriminatory in a fundamental way. I also think that if, for example, we identify that male students struggle with mathematics, if we then put together an intervention to address this, does that mean that we are excluding female students who might benefit from it? So I think ethically, we might be treading on unstable water, just to make that point. And uh, I think having said that, I'm rather going to keep my mouth shut. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Graham. I, I just want to put everyone at ease. We are <clears throat> that complicated template of ABT we've simplified. We are not requesting data on uh, first generation students. We uh, are actually working with the first time entering students in the cohort analysis. <clears throat> so you don't need to stress about that one. Uh, you will see that the template that we've developed is much simpler. And then secondly, what was the other point I wanted to make? Oh, no, I've forgotten. Maybe I'll remember later. Let's rather go on to the next one. Can, can I just make a comment about the yeah. ethics? Um, we know that uh, throughout the world, young men are not performing at the same level as young women. And we need to address this in some way. But that doesn't mean that you exclude women from any process. No, no. Yes, I think that's the other point I wanted to make. We are not saying you must use the data and identify, let's say, for, for instance, African males are performing the worst. So you're just going to focus in on uh, supporting them. That's not the idea. The only reason why we... Uh, report like this is just to see are we in overall making progress in uh, closing the gaps in performance it's not about who we're going to target it's just to see are we making progress are africans doing better are the gap between african and white students performance becoming smaller that's what we want to achieve so it's only for monitoring purposes not for targeting groups for interventions and obviously one shouldn't exclude anyone Nisa, you want to comment quickly? Oh, sorry, I posted my question in the chat. I should have lowered my hand. Just oh, want to oh. confirm that I align on the difference between the first gen and first time entering. What's the key difference there in terms of how you're utilizing those terms? Okay, first time entering is students that register for the first time at a university in a qualification. 
uh, first generation students are students that are the first students from their family that attend higher education. But we find that too problematic to use as a, as a group for analyzing. Not all universities have that information available. Ku, you wanted to add something? Yeah, thanks, Charles. And actually on that and um, first generation in particular, um, what DUT found was that we collected this data through SASE, right? South African Survey of Student Engagement and the BUSI. And although it was self-reported data, when we analyzed the data and we then, uh, you know, correlated it with things like success rates, which was all data that the institution collected, we did find, um, you know, a correlation between first gen. We also, uh, you know, when we looked at the data, found a correlation between who was accessing support more so than others. And so first gen data, it, it's quite a useful you know, it's, it's useful. Um, and just to let colleagues know yeah. that those who are participating in the SASE, I would highly recommend it because SASE does collect data that we do not collect institutionally, you know, um, and it's useful data. Thanks, Charles. Okay, thanks. I think the point is that universities can work on this, but we're not requiring them to report on that to Kresge. Uh, I think we just need to move on uh, to get the other, give the others opportunities. Walter Sassoula University. Good day, colleagues. Um, we're sharing the, the sentiments with other universities. Uh, we, we, okay, I thought there's something, there's someone talking. We, the time was not enough for us uh, to complete and looking at the complexity of the data. Uh, also, we agree that the uh, data that was missing, for example, first generation status, maybe it's because we didn't understand quite sure, we're not quite sure about uh, first generation. Um, and, and the first time entering, maybe there, there was a gray area there. Um, I think we, we, we also need to go back to, to, to faculty looking for uh, some of the information that was not clear for us. Um, thank you. Thank you. It would help if I unmute myself. <laughs> uh, UCT, would you like to report to us? Uh, sure. Thanks, Charles. Um, in our group, we agreed that all the indicators are very helpful to inform student success uh, strategies. Uh, some of the data gaps that we identified, um, we said it would be very important to have a student fee debt data. Uh, because uh, at your city, they won't allow you to register for the next year or to graduate if you have a fee debt. So that will impact the graduation rates and retention rates. And then we also said it would be very useful to see what happens after graduation. So uh, are the students getting employed? So what, what is happening in their life post-graduation? Thanks. I think those are the kind of analyses that the university will find very useful to actually explore their student success data and enrich it much more. Um, SMU, Faku Makhatu University, Health Sciences University, I think. Yes, thank you, Charles. Um, yes, we agreed that um, the four indicators are very useful. Um, they look comprehensive. But uh, now, as I was listening to the other colleagues um, uh, reflecting on their discussions, I want to agree with uh, Graham Dumpy, who pointed out a definitional issues, right? And, um, you know, same thing called differently or same thing look looked at differently. Case in point here, if we look at the definition of um, the, what's that indicator? I think the third indicator, module pass rate. Um, today's Definition says that is uh, the number of students that pass exam um, as compared to those that enrolled at the last date of registration. But if we take it one week back and look at the definition that we looked at uh, last week for the same indicator, 
we did, we said it's the number of students that pass the exam um, as compared to the number of students that um, I think uh, well the total number of enrollments minus cancellation the two to me does not seem like it's the same thing and um, be because it's defined different and all of that it might produce different results so we might want to relook at the definitions and use maybe similar weddings and uh, similar formulas for um, for the same thing there. Um, that's one thing for me. And I thought that, um, or rather we said that for us, the ind when we look at the indicators there, we might want to add things like, you know, we want to see from which quintiles our students are coming from, look at uh, gender. And uh, we are a health science university and um, most of our students or some of our students would be doing medicine and dentistry and so forth. Degrees which may or or rather that takes more than four years. So we might want to have that reflect. And um, similar to other institutions, we have some uh, gaps in our information. For example, the first generation students, we do not have um, that information, but we thought that probably could be one of the uh, fields during the um, application process, uh, but also could conduct some institutional research, you know, surveys to kind of um, try and gather some form of, some form of data there um the other thing that we mentioned well we couldn't get or rather finalize the third point there because uh we do not we did not have all the data in front of us so we couldn't really think about or rather analyze the trends over the previous um few years so uh yes that point we left it at that and said that maybe we need to check um, the same data over um, a few years and see if we can come up with trends there. Um, going back to the definitional issues uh, for, for me, this, this indicator tends to look at the students that um, really succeeded in entering the, the, the university uh, field. But now um, I want to now Think about that one student who applied and um, they qualified the registered, but then they realized that, um, you know, a month later, but it's still within the registration period that, you know, um, that bursary or that I was, uh, that I thought I'm going to get, I'm not going to get, I'm not getting that funding. Therefore, I have no choice but to drop out at that point. This student is going into a black hole and um, no one of the indicator takes uh, consideration of the student. So it's, it's, they do not exist. But if, we're, if we want to think about student success and say funding is one of the issue, then such a student should be looked at at some point. Um, and I say this because um, there was this one study that we did in a different context, uh, which I don't want to mention here. But um, in that study, we learned that 71% of all student dropouts in that particular program, they actually happened in the period between, in that registration period. And we did follow up um, that number or that quantitative stats with some qualitative um, information uh, research. And we learned that most of it was uh, because of uh, issues of funding, which was the majority of the students said, I could not get um, the funding, therefore I had to drop out. Some of them would say, but oh, okay, I went in there, I lost interest, or maybe I did not have the time for this anymore. But it is important to also take such students into consideration if we are really um, looking at the success of a student. But yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, it looks like, especially with pass rate, we will still have to work a bit on the definition, especially when it comes to cancellations, because there's, in a sense, students that cancel because they, they realize very quickly this module is not what they want to do. And then there are others who cancel maybe at the point when they realize they're never going to pass it. Uh, yeah, it's it's a tricky one, but we'll we'll give some sort of it, um, and and maybe in the convening uh, session we can perhaps quickly talk about the definition of of pass rate. I think that's the only complex one. Elizabeth, you want to comment? Yes, I want to comment. I think Charles, there are two two uh, two things or three things actually I want to point out. Let, let me start with the one that we are talking about now in terms of definitions and also what we are reporting on. There is nothing that is stopping any institution when they go back to their own institution to start analyzing their data and look at it 
in the way that makes sense for their own institution. What we're trying to do in Siapumelala is to standardize yeah. some of the things so that we are able to report the same for everyone. Because when we're not standardizing as well, it creates confusion. So the, the importance of data def definition, it's um, I cannot even overemphasize on that. All institutions, when you're creating a report and you are deriving a KPI or an indicator, you need to supply the definition of how you got there. Um, what we, we also encourage you when you supply the data for Siapumelela to use the HEMIS information. When you use that, already the cancellations are taken into consideration because we take it at, the yes. start at that point in time. Already, we have excluded those who canceled during the course of the year. So you don't even have to worry about uh, when did they terminate and all that. But that becomes an operational issue in your own institution to look at your processes. Number two, you will, oh, I'm still on the same, but I'm, I'm, I'm calling it number two, I don't know why. The other thing is you will find lectures that says, this students never uh, participated in my module, but the student is still registered on the institutional system. That is a process issue. It's not the data issue. We need to be able to discuss these things as an institution and make data definitions that make sense for the lecture, for the institution, and also for operational reporting or for statutory reporting or reporting external because the definition might be different. So we need to take that into consideration and not mix or confuse things as well. And all the templates come, come with definition. So we should be able to go back and look at the definition and look at whether do they make sense at this point in time? Do we need to adjust them or not? Uh, what I also want to talk about is the disaggregation of data and why we, we do it. We're doing it and the purpose of uh, disaggregating. We cannot go go get away with not disaggregating the information because we've been applying blanket approaches. All females, all males are receiving the same interventions. But we know still males are not performing at the same rate. And this brings the equity mindset into play. We need to start looking at how we personalized the support that we offer to our students. And we can only do that if we are disaggregating the information. We're not saying use this information to punish. And we're not saying neglect the other group. What we're saying is, what are the things, what are the challenges, what are the, 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 the blockages that male students are facing that we as an institution, we can put some interventions in place to help alleviate those challenges so that they can still perform at the same rate as female. But we're not saying with other support, don't give females only concentrate on male. We're not saying that, but we say, can we create targeted, targeted support that helps the male to also, and, uh, to also perform at the same rate? And that will be, when we are doing justice to our male students. We're not saying use it for punitive, but we also not say, when you look at the data, don't do anything because it is just for reporting. It's not for reporting, it's for us to apply and support the group that is not performing at its best and get them to the same level, but not also neglecting the other. And that is the equity minded, minded, uh, minded uh, people or minded ways that we need to drive Siapumele. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think the important point is also here that we we know that females and males sometimes come from the same disadvantaged background and the same schools, but still there's a huge gap in performance, and that's what we're trying to understand. Sorry, I we still have to give SU an opportunity to provide feedback. And then we are actually running out of time a bit here. Issue? Sorry, Hi. Miss, I'll come back there. Yes, just a very short feedback from, from our side. Um, we are familiar with those uh, four key indicators with the retention rate, the throughput, the success rate. Uh, in terms of the high impact modules, we tend to look at what we call high risk modules. It's more um, modules 
uh, not necessarily with the highest enroll, uh, enrollment numbers, but with the lowest pass rates. But mm. uh, we then look at modules with a reasonable number of students, and not those with only 10 or 20 students in a module. So we have access to reports currently on Power BI, which would give their uh, visual overview of, of, for example, retention rates and throughput rates. The challenge is actually to get that information to the decision makers, to make sure that the right people have access to their information, but also to understand it, to know how to interpret the data and not to overwhelm them with the massive amount of information that is available. And um, that we also yeah. discussed that, and I think that's important that we have to look at the university of how we are going to make this data accessible to a larger audience. And how do we, from our analytical uh, departments, how do we engage with the teaching and learning environment and to make sure that we all understand the data and what is useful and how can we present the data that would probably be more useful for them to make their decisions. Thank you. You need a quick input. We need to close. I think people have got other obligations now. Thanks. Yeah, so I think in order to help with uh, managing the raising of hands, if we could have someone then sweep the chat because there's a a discussion that's happening here around definitions that I okay. think confirms that we need more granular definitions. So if one of the coaches can take the responsibility of just responding on the chat, then we can be biased towards that in order to save time. But on definitions, we must, must get, unless there's a document or there's a resource I was trying to find it that has these granular definitions. But just have a look at the chat because we're having a bit of a back and forth and other point I want to make is I do have a challenge around leveraging the Hermes information because we all know that Hermes information is a snapshot that's prepared three times a year. And what we're trying to drive here is continuous monitoring of key metrics, right? So again, as much as we might have Volpec definitions that already handle certain things, it's very important that we provide very granular clarity on some of these definitions so that we can uh, incorporate these into okay. our continuous business intelligence systems. Thank you. Can I Thank just you. make a, a comment? I have put in the um, chat definitions that we created in the first round of Siapu Malela. And we can always go back to them and revitalize them or change them. Okay, thanks, Alan. I think we're done from my side. If you, uh, I don't know if we just need to remind people that they must select a key performance indicator for next week. And uh, do put the data together, do visualization, look at the story to tell, because next week will be your opportunity to showcase uh, well done data analysis and interpretation to us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Charles. Still thank fun. you, Elizabeth. And thank you for all the participants for your engagement. Do they still need to do an evaluation? Um, yes. The, on the, but the in the, if you want your um, evaluate, if you want to get your certificate, go back to the. Um, you want me to put the link in again, and do the evaluation. I think, Alan, sorry, it's cool. Just to remind colleagues that there is an activity that they need to work on um, over the course on before next week. So choose an indicator, decide on data visualization, etc. cetera. Uh, it's it's in the already, module. Yeah, Charles already did explain that. Um, ah, okay. They will come and do their presentation. So next week, me and Charles would just um, facilitate the engagement. So it's the 
institutions. Um, you, you come with your presentation already. If you want to do a live presentation, make sure that your system works properly. Uh, we do allow for that. You can showcase from your live system, uh, but we know when you're doing live, sometimes technology let us down, uh, but we also, you can um, also do a PowerPoint slide and we will have a facility where you can uh, upload that PowerPoint. And I think that's the mode that we would prefer. Uh, you will have enough time next week to showcase your um, your KPIs. You can choose multiple, you can do one. What we want is from last week and this week, what we've discussed, are you able to implement it? Are you able to tell a data story about your student success initiative in terms of looking at the data? And that's the overall um, for next week, Wednesday. Elizabeth, the question there about the suggested duration, uh, C. Allen's responded up to 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah, like that yes. sounds sounds about right. Yes, so that is why a PowerPoint slide will, might be reasonable because then we will also allow for question and answer and discussion from the other audience. Mm -hmm. So aim for 10 to 15 minutes in your presentation. Are there any questions? If not, then thank you very much. See you next week. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye.